Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show that covers difficult topics we don't usually shine lights on into the open because these hidden things imprison us. I'm Toby Dore. In today's episode, we're going to meet Leslie Ahmadi, who will help us understand how you can combine different cultures and different races and even different countries and create an extended family. I'm so delighted to introduce you to my friend, Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Thanks so much for joining me on Fierce Conversations with Toby. Thanks, Toby. I'm thrilled to be here. I know you are. I've been looking forward to this. Me too. So I like to start out by asking just a simple question to get us started without anything too difficult, and that is, what is your favorite color and why? You know, actually, I have more than one favorite color. I do, too. Um, <laughs> but in the, um, in the interest of justice, I think I'll choose a color that maybe is, is less talked about in the context of being a favorite color. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's a color that, um, well, in my, uh, in my experience, it's often overlooked. Mm-hmm. Um, undervalued Mm -hmm. uh but it's the color brown brown interesting yeah i've never had anybody pick brown i've had people pick black and white and everything in between but not brown yeah exactly and i was exactly the same way too i didn't pay much attention to the color brown uh until um when I was in college, I started experimenting with hair color. My natural oh. hair color was black, mm-hmm. and I put a warm cocoa brown in my hair. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that changed the whole, um, <clears throat> what should I say, palette of what would look good on me in terms yes. of you mm-hmm. know, colors. So I began to notice that um, when I put on brown shades, suddenly I would come to life. Mm. Uh, I put on the chocolatey browns, the caramel browns, the uh-huh. honey browns, the hazelnut browns, the, you know, the deep dark chocolate or um, mahogany brown. Yes. And all that they looked good against my own complexion, which is also brown. Right. And, uh-huh. Uh huh. <laughs> then I noticed, uh, because I still didn't give up on, give up on wearing bright brilliant colors Mm -hmm. um i started to notice also that these colors would look more vibrant these reds these oranges these greens these rainbow colors these jewel tones these ice tones would look even more beautiful when put against a brown background like a like a garden a beautiful bright Uh on the good solid brown Mm -hmm. dark earth so i love that I love that. That's really interesting. I think Thanks that's for asking so cool. That question. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. totally different. Uh, and I love that answer. I like things that are outside the box. So can you tell us about a turning point in your life and how the path you chose impacted you? Sure. When I was barely 30 years old and I was starting graduate school at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Um, I met, became friends with, and quickly fell in love with an extraordinary human being who was from a different country, a different race, and a different faith tradition from mine. So he wasn't exactly the person that I would have thought I would marry someday. Mm -hmm. But not only did this gentleman have the audacity to propose to me, to propose <laughs> marriage to me, but um, he also asked that when we both finished our graduate studies, I would start a new life with him in his home country, which happened to be the Islamic Republic of Iran. What a difference from America. There's a For lot sure. to change it. For yes. sure. And mm-hmm. so I had a very important choice to make. Here was this wonderful, beautiful human being and man who I really was in love with and who I really trusted with all my heart. Mm-hmm. And here was the a place that I had never been to, but was 
whenever I did hear about it or see about it, it was generally through images in the media that didn't sit um, easily mm-hmm. with me and a lot of people. And so I, you know, I had to decide which way I was going to go. And um, it was the hardest decision I'd ever had to make. But mm-hmm. in the end, um, after four years, I um, I married him. And then four years after that, we moved and lived in Iran. Yes, that is quite an adjustment. And you had to learn a different language too, didn't yeah, you? Did. And a different culture. And I did. Yeah. I did. Um, I think that's beautiful. And you speak several languages, don't you? Yes. Um, well, I speak English, my native language. Mm-hmm. I speak Spanish, which was the language I chose as my career to teach Spanish. Mm-hmm. Because I thought, it's, I just think it's a beautiful language. Mm-hmm. Um, no other reason. And um, yeah, being a, a language and culture person, I mean, that was part of my career um, to teach others foreign languages and to mm-hmm. teach them to appreciate other cultures. So I was kind of in an ironic situation where I didn't know if I was that comfortable going <laughs> to the culture. But so I couldn't tell anybody because that didn't fit the role. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I know in your blog, you have shared some uh, beautiful poetry in Farsi and Persian. And Mm -hmm. and you've interviewed a a few, we've brought some Iranian people into our lives. So Mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful how you cross that culture and combine them. So you captured this story in a memoir. Can you tell us about it? And is your book available? Um, yes, I have written a memoir. Uh, I remember the day in Iran, I was driving in a car and I knew at that moment I was going to write this book. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's tells a story. Oh, no, it tells the story of me, a black American Christian woman. And as I said, the person who was teaching other people to appreciate other cultures, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who was, who is too ashamed or maybe too proud to admit that I'm terrified to make (laughs) me over to Mm -hmm. Iran. I I didn't even tell my husband that, Um, you know, he wanted me to start a new life with him in his homeland, Iran. So the rest of the story is about how I really deny those feelings um, and leave Columbus, Ohio and start a new life with him anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's not the the book is is right now in search of a publisher, so it's not presently available. But um, I do have a website. I would invite anyone who wants to hear more of this story or more about the fascinating life that people live in Iran and 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 through my eyes. Mm-hmm. I would I would be delighted if they would uh, come to my website at Leslie Amadi. Uh, that's just my name, a h m a d i um, dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, and and sign up for my newsletter. Yes, and we're going to have a link to that in the show notes, so listeners okay. will be able to just click on it and go to your website. And if oh. you're interested in Leslie's book, if you join her uh, email list, you will certainly know when it's available. Yeah. So I think that's beautiful. What's the title of your book? Road. Between Two Hearts, uh, A Black American Bride Discovers Iran. And if I can briefly explain what that, where the road between two hearts comes from, um, it it may sound like it's the connection between a man and a woman, mm-hmm. the love that and I had. That's easy to assume. But it really isn't re- referring to that. It, it all started with that. But it's certainly, it expanded to a heart between me and the man, my husband, and it spread to my heart to all of the people that I came to know and love in the, in Iran. Mm-hmm. And so there's an expression in Persian that's like the Persian language is full of all these kind of quotes. And it says, a road can always be found between two hearts. Oh, I love that. Isn't that beautiful. Can you say that in Persian? Yes. Del be del radare. I love that. I think that uh, that is such a beautiful language to hear. 
It is to me too, Toby. And I love how you combined that and made it into the title of your book. And it has a special meaning in Iran, but it also has a special meaning because we know it's a love story between two people. So I kind of like titles that have that double entendre. Yes, and my yes. book did that with Living with Conviction. So yes. I just think it's it just expands the possibilities of the book. So I love that. But I, I never knew until just now that that was an Iranian saying. And I love that. Well, can I say one quick other thing about yes. it? Yes. Uh, there's a scene in the book that it's, it's a scene, but it really happened, of course, because it was a memoir. Uh -huh. but when... Um, we brought our one-year-old daughter to Iran for the first time. There was a circle of my husband's family, curious to meet us all and okay. curious to talk. And curious but especially to Noparisa, our little girl, who was just one year old. Mm -hmm. and her grandmother, we were seated in a circle, and her grandmother was seated directly across on the other side of the circle. And her grandmother took her arms and opened them up. Okay. Saying, come, come with her hands. Petty said, I had not seen her before. And mm -hmm. I don't know what happened, but she broke free from her daddy's hug and ran straight to the arms of her grandmother uh. and hugged her. And that's when my mother in law, her grandmother, said, Del ve del rodere. Uh. There's always a road between two hearts. Wow. A third meaning for the book. Yes. I yes. love that. Yes. Wow. That just gives me goosebumps. That's beautiful. Yes. I dinner. love that. So um, was there ever a time that you really felt imprisoned? And if so, what did you do to liberate yourself? Um, I'm so glad that you asked the question that way, Toby, because it brings me back to a book I really love and admire, which is your book, Living with Conviction mm -hmm. and Talking About Prisons. Mm -hmm. And as you do so ably, you know, you point out that there are physical prisons, mm -hmm. such as you experienced, but that there are also other, all kinds of other prisons, prisons that can impact us negatively because of trauma, mm -hmm. um, because of the prisons we put ourselves in, whether it's uh, guilt, shame, self-doubt, uh, any number of negative feelings that keep us from moving forward. Mm -hmm. In my case, well, it was this fear I had, this terror that I couldn't tell anyone about mm -hmm. going to Iran. Mm -hmm. um, it, it haunted me. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I felt committed to do this, and I loved my husband. But, yeah, I was uh, not, not a happy camper, as mm -hmm. my husband and I was going. And so how do you reconcile that? I guess in the end, Toby, I followed my heart. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, took a leap of faith and I halfway reached out. Mm -hmm. uh, a little more than half. <laughs> I, ha I, I reached out to the people in that new world and in who are so dear to my husband and People and, and the whole culture and whatever I did to reach out, it was returned to me ten times mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. by the heart of this people who took me in. I love that. That is that is beautiful. And you know, I can imagine. I mean, I never really left the country. I mean, I've been to Canada, I've been to Mexico, but that those kind of don't count. Um, I know I would be thinking. Oh my gosh, I got to wear one of those things and cover my yes. face and my yes. head. And what am yeah. I going to do? Yeah, no, no, that's very true. And I, I think, you know, it was only five years after the Iranian or the Islamic revolution mm -hmm. and the American hostage crisis, mm -hmm. a best selling book about, uh, you know, an American woman who had uh, lived with her husband in the States and, under false pretenses, he took her to Iran and told her that she and her daughter were not going to Yes, go I read and that And everyone was talking about it was all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And I knew with my head that these things, you can't judge a whole group of people based on one story mm -hmm. or a groups of people that might, we might be exposed to. And yet, you know, you know that in your head, but it messes with your head. at the Yes. Same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, 
I, re I remember seeing this uh, on the TV, the, the images of women wearing clothes that I could not imagine myself wearing. Uh -huh. And it really did contribute to the, um, to the terror. And I know, you know, as a black American woman, I know what it feels like to be judged based on misconceptions uh -huh. or to be those eyes. So I knew that, but I couldn't shake it. Um, wow. Right away, until again, bit by bit, mm -hmm. people themselves eased my fear and showed me, gave me a completely different set of eyes. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. So it's interesting, you know, you said as a, as a black American woman, you kind of felt that there were times when you were judged without merit, you know, judged by something else. And in this fear of yours and going to Iran, you were kind of almost doing the very same thing. Exactly. Yeah. You didn't get me off the hook. Yes, that's right. We all have to do our work. We all have biases. We all mm -hmm. have to That's true. And sometimes I think you can't really understand an issue until you can see both sides of it, until you can experience both sides of it. And then it opens up your eyes and it changes your perspective. I so, agree with you, Toby. So that was a, definitely a great experience, I think. Who has been your most important mentor? Well, I had in my lifetime a few mentors, but I think in the context of this conversation, I think one of my most special mentors was my father-in-law, my husband's mm -hmm. father, mm -hmm. whom I called Baba, which mm -hmm. means daddy in Persian. Mm -hmm. I did not know or notice that all the nine children in, uh, of Baba's and Maman's um, called him the equivalent of sir. Oh. Uh, but here I was. Just calling him daddy. Nobody told me. Nobody <laughs> taught me. She got to do that. <laughs> but we had a very intimate relationship. Yeah. And I believe that in terms of graciousness, in terms of sense of humor, in terms of wisdom, and in terms of faith in God, he was one of the best examples to mm -hmm. me of that. And he was also one of the best as a as a devout Muslim man, he also was a wonderful model to me of how to enjoy and be enriched by an interfaith relationship. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, he, in my case, you know, coming as a Christian to a predominantly Muslim country and uh, legally or you know, officially with the the um the religion of islam um he all he never made me feel less than i was a i was a minority there i was the in the minority faith in mm -hmm. iran rather than the majority faith as i am in the united states but he always made me feel like a fellow sister a fellow person of faith uh-huh and Didn't, we had some wonderful conversations because of that. Do I remember a story where he gave you a cross or something? Um, yes, yes, indeed. I, um, he and Maman, I haven't said much about Maman because she didn't talk a lot through her uh -huh. my mother in law, but she just showed everything through her actions. Uh -huh. She was a great, dear, and lovely uh -huh. woman. Um, but um, before I met either Baba or Maman, they 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 left. They they gave a, a gift to me through my husband, who came back from Iran, and it was from them. It was a gold pendant, and um, and it had the word God inscribed on it. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what the message was. I didn't know if that meant that they wanted me to see God in a certain way and to conform in a certain way, or I just didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. Then when the light hit it, I noticed it from a different way. And I saw 
there was the image of a cross yeah. imposed on it. And I, it took my breath away because it was his way. It was their way of saying, we love you and we accept you. Yes. You are, and you are, you, your life is in God's hands. And mm -hmm. this is, this is you and this is for you. I think that's beautiful. And this was before you'd met them. Is that correct? Met them. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful reaching out of a gift. Yeah. That had to I help ease your mind. Perhaps I should have worn it today. Oh, yes. That would have been beautiful. <laughs> well, when we get together in October, you need to bring it so I can see it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So you returned to the USA from Iran in 1996. What brought you back to the States? And how has living here uh, impacted your husband and children and your family since then? Hmm. That was um. That was a a much tougher decision than some might think. My hardest, the hardest decision I ever had to make was whether to marry, and start a new life with my husband and go to mm -hmm. Iran. But the second hardest decision was whether to go back to the United States or not. Mm -hmm. And it was it was hard because. Um, yes, I was longing for home. I won't, I won't lie. Well, I was not for the familiarity of home and, um, my sisters, my, my family, my friends, my communities. Um, uh, but I would also be leaving my husband's home and a place that had really become a home for me too, uh -huh. not only for me, but the children. So, um, it really, it was really hard emotionally, but it, it actually, in the end, it boiled down to practical considerations, um, mostly around what would life, the question, what would life look like for our children here versus there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, not so as easy a decision as one thinks, but, but, but it was that. And also the consideration of which of the two countries would better allow us economically to, to keep a, um, connections with both countries mm -hmm. to be able to travel back and forth. And so in the end, the U.S. won out. Mm -hmm. um, once again, uh, I so appreciate Baba and Maman who said to us, they didn't say, no, you should stay here. They said, whatever is best for your family, you must think in terms of that. And no. so we, we, with their blessings, um, we we went. By that time, we had two children, not just Parisa, but another little boy. I mean, a little boy named Nikki, and um, and we went. We went. We went home. Mm -hmm. We left home to be able to go home. Yes, yes, that would be a tough decision. At, but have you been back to Iran to visit many times? Yes, that was that again. That was one of our goals. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have been able. To come to the America and visit as much from Iran mm -hmm. as vice versa. So right. every two to three years, um, we would make a trip and spend a summer. I mm -hmm. had a job, a teaching job that allowed me to do that. Oh, I see. Did and your uh, mother and father-in-law ever come to the United States? No, they never did. Mm -hmm. They never did. I know that Baba and Maman, ha Baba had a brother who lived in Scotland and they went as far as that, but uh. they never were able to come. They've they have since passed. I'm I'm sorry. Yes. They, they died twelve years ago. Uh -huh. But I have, my love and respect for them hasn't reduced even yes. little. I can tell. I can bit. certainly yeah. tell that. So now that you live back in the United States, you're actually back in Columbus, Ohio, where everything began. How has your time in Iran had impact on your current life? I think there are little things that, that rubbed off on me when I was in Iran. Um, it's not quite as strong as it was um, 30 years ago when we came back. I can't believe it 30 years ago. <laughs> but um, but little, little gestures that I had found very charming, little niceties, that was something I liked about the Persian culture. Um, 
uh, these little formalities that really were signs of affection to me or mm -hmm. warmth. So, for example, standing up when uh, a guest or an older person came into the room. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the older person. Everybody stands up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I know the feeling. <laughs> um, putting my hand on my heart as a greeting rather oh. than um, extending a hand and uh -huh. therefore, you know, limiting body contact, but still showing that, mm -hmm. that it matters. And in fact, I think that's almost a warmer way of. Yeah, I love greeting. that. I like that too. Yeah. I do yeah. think it's more of enriching. Yeah. yeah, I really, I really like that. Mm -hmm. um, bringing somebody who comes by um, refreshment without asking them, do you want oh, refreshment? Oh, yes. I think I remember you telling me that story. Can you repeat that here? The purpose of that? Well, um, I don't remember this conversation with you, but I'll tell you anyway. It's just that in the Persian culture, people don't want to bother each other. So if I were to say, Toby, would you like a, a cup of tea? You're supposed to say, oh, no, no, um, because you don't want to bother me. Mm -hmm. So I, it's upon me to make sure that I just bring you the, the tea. and so Without I, asking. With, without asking. Mm -hmm. but, so nobody told me that rule. So there were a lot of people who left our house hungry and thirsty because I asked them what <laughs> something and no one said, Oh, okay. <laughs> I bet that didn't happen for too long. <laughs> no, I hope not. Yeah. Um, then, but I think the most significant thing I um, had to do with my tolerance for, or my ability to be in uh, in spaces where other people were. I needed, as as a bona fide introvert, I needed a lot of time by myself. But I didn't get much of that at all when I was in Iran. And there were always people around. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we stayed with my husband's family for a few months before we moved into our own house. By the time we got to our new house, and it was just he and me and Parisa, this big house, it felt so empty and I was so lonely. Mm -hmm. And that's something, is, something that has uh, rubbed off on me even now. I think it has influenced me. Um, we are now... Our children are grown up. One daughter and her husband live with us. We are in, and my husband's brother lives with us. We mm -hmm. are a, um, what do you call it? A multi generational yes. family. Yes. Yes. And that's how we like it. And I, I think like it that's too. what you have in common, yes, right? Yes, it is. It is because we live with my stepson and his wife and their two children. Mm -hmm. And they, we have a space in the walkout basement. That's our own space. So we can close the door and we have our space, but we're right here in the same house and the kids come down and up. Like it's, there's no door there. You know, and we have so breakfast cool. together once a week and we go out to eat together. And I think there is so much strength and so much enrichment and so much, bonding when you live in an expanded family. And I think that's how, you know, cultures used to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we've grown apart from that. And I tell you, I like it this way. I just feel a part of something bigger than myself. I know, Toby. I bet there, are, I know there are lots of people who wonder how we can possibly want yeah. this. Originally. But we do. We yes. really get like it, right, Toby? It's yes. beautiful. Yes, it really is. It's nice to talk to you in um, in Zoom conversations and see your grandchildren come into view. Yes. <laughs> Elle Shiley and uh -huh. their grandmother. It's yes, just my little amazing. granddaughter. She's special, but she knows what I love. And um, so I love bird's nests and eggs. And so see my little robin's eggs? I'll come yeah. down to my desk and there'll be a, a robin's egg laying on my desk. And she's oh. found it out in the yard and she knows how much I love them. And she just wow. brings them in and lays them gently on my desk. So I've started putting them in a shell and, and keeping them on my desk. And, you know, it's just, it just is such a deeper relationship than we ever had when we yeah. lived separately. So yeah. I think yeah, it's, it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So can you offer any advice to people who are contemplating a cross-cultural romantic relationship or marriage or even a friendship? 
Wow. We only had uh, ten minutes, five more minutes, right? <laughs> oh, there's no one. time limit. No, we don't have a time limit. <laughs> well, I, I'll I'll try to keep it down to a couple of principles. I uh, I don't know if I'll be successful, but I think the most important thing is for a person to know himself or herself. Know 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 your values. Know your values and those things that are most dear to you. That's not as easy a thing to identify as we might think because our values, the things that uh, we think that 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 we think are important for governing governing our lives and our relationships with other people, come to us so naturally. We grow up in cultures and mm -hmm. we kind of learn from our surroundings, and we think everybody else knows that that. That's how it works. Right. The truth is that people don't all mm -hmm. know what it works. People, ha everybody has their own, um, every country has different cultures and cultures within cultures. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important, first of all, to know one's own values and then to be able to um, figure out what are the most important and to, to find out the same thing from our perspective partner or mm -hmm. friend that's more mm -hmm. in the context of romance and to find out which ones you know you can compromise on and which ones are the non-negotiables yeah that's a really good point mm -hmm. yeah and i i think um when you're in love you th those are the last things you think about you know um but it's really helpful to do that but as i said it is it is challenging because you don't know what questions to ask each other you don't even know what how to delineate the different values, but there are books out there and reference. You, uh -huh. you can go on to Google or you can go to Amazon. There are more and more cross-cultural um, couples in the United States and in the world. Uh -huh. So you can go into Google or uh, Amazon and, and uh, enter the search term cross-cultural love or intercultural love. And there are some really pretty nice guides uh -huh. that help you um, you know, ask each other questions. You could even make it a romantic game of it, uh, uh -huh. an evening of it, asking questions that, you know, help to gauge what your beliefs are about time and timeliness, uh -huh. Uh -huh. how you, how a person should spend their money, um, how much privacy does one require or not require. Um, Those are important, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah, and and so just be sure that you give yourself a space to to um, explore those things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, down, I think the second thing I would say is to know that, well, in all fairness, um, cross cultural relationships are not necessarily for everybody. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's not for everybody. Um, I think. Uh, there are challenges. I, I know I spoke a, in an enamored way, like a kid with a crush, about my experience in Iran. But it wasn't all easy. It wasn't <laughs> all um, mm -hmm. goodness and light. I there were there were things to have to struggle with. But I do believe there are some people who may be predisposed to uh, tolerate those differences because the rewards and the delights of being in a new world and with different people mm -hmm. and new adventures um, are stronger mm -hmm. and make it possible to overcome those things. So yeah. there's no shame in saying, oh, I like you a lot. I, I love you a lot, but this is not for us to be. Right. You know, the, a big, big question also is what country, mm -hmm. you know, what place are you going to live? Mm -hmm. You know, so God has been good to us, Toby. We've, been in both countries and we're we're still together you know enjoying the best of both worlds mm -hmm. i think that's beautiful you know our daughter-in-law is from moldova which is a small country that's next to ukraine it's between ukraine and romania i didn't even know moldova existed until she came into our life but so we have some of that cross-cultural you know stuff Thank here you. too and you know her parents, Lucia's parents, don't speak any English at all. And they've been here several times to visit. And, you know, I just, 
I just talk to them and keep going. And, you know, and Lucia will say, you know, they don't understand English. I said, well, that's all right. They'll figure it out, you know, and I'll just keep going. Uh, but one of the sweetest things I think is uh, my uh, Lucia's mother knew that I was writing a book and she knew what my story was. And she was here to visit when the Dateline episode came out and she watched it on TV. And I'm thinking, what is she thinking? You know, here I am, you know, getting arrested and, you know, what couldn't she be thinking? But, you know, she never had a problem with it. When my book was published, she said to Lucia, why didn't Toby give me a book, send me a book? And I said, well, it's in English, you know, but I sent her a book and, and I looked up the Romanians, their language, they speak Romanian and Russian, but I, I looked up in Romanian and I signed the book and I wrote it in Romanian. I looked it up on the internet, but I sent her that book. And she read the whole thing. And you know how she read it? One page at a time, she'd take a picture of it with her phone and do Google Translate. Oh, my goodness. And she read the whole book. Oh, and I thought, wow. No, no, no. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like the, something like the cross story. You yes. know, she wants yeah. so much to know your story. Yes. Yes. I think that's it's beautiful. Well, now she's passing my book all around in Moldova. <laughs> So I think that's so interesting. I love that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's a pretty fun story. So is there a question you wish I had asked you? Yes, Toby, there is. Oh, good. I wish that you had asked me how it was that we first came to know each other. Ah. How that happened. Uh-huh. So tell us about that. Okay. So once upon a time, about maybe 14 years ago, I was getting ready. I was in the living room. I was getting ready to work and I had the TV on. I, I think it was, I think it was the Today Show. It was one of the morning programs. And lo and behold, I heard in the news that there was a story of a young volunteer, a woman who <laughs> had escaped and helped an inmate who had been convicted of a serious crime escaped and they ran off because of love together. And I just stopped everything I was doing. And I, 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 I listened and I, it, it, it impressed me. I don't know. I wish I could remember more in what specific way, but I know it really, it really left an impression on me. Um, and uh, little did I know that 14 years later, I would meet people <laughs> in this in 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 a group of 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 um, aspiring memoir writers. Yes, or, isn't that yeah. interesting? I never knew that. I didn't know that you remembered me from TV. That's that's really interesting. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, I'm so glad we met, Toby. Me too. Me too. I think it's beautiful. You know, one time. Chris and I were uh, doing some garage sailing and this was maybe like three or four years after I'd gotten out of prison and we went into this garage sale and this woman told us she was moving and she said, and I really need to find a home for my dog. Do you want to take my dog? And she said, you know, my dog has such an awesome story. He was in this prison dog program called Safe Harbor. And I went into PetSmart and this woman who ran it said, I have just the perfect dog for you. And she showed me this dog and I adopted it. And then several weeks later, she ran away with one of the inmates. And I have always wondered my whole life, how is she doing? Oh. And, and this is a garage sale. And I said, you know, Chris looked at her and she looked at me and he said, I think she's doing pretty good. And she said, now, how would you know? And then she looked at me and she said, you're her. Oh my goodness. That's, <laughs> so, that's so sweet. So interesting. It yes. Is. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So is there a question you'd like to ask me? Oh, well, that was the, qu that was the question. Okay. Um, wait a minute. Well, let's see the question that I, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had a goofy moment. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Toby, anyone who has read your book or knows your story knows that you've had an extraordinary life. Um, and part of that extraordinary experience 
has also included very difficult, very painful experiences and losses in your life. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, just like I was talking about my bub, Baba, I think when I see you, I see not that you don't have your times of discouragement like mm -hmm. everyone else, mm -hmm. but most of the time when I see you, I see, a, I feel a joy. I feel an energy. Um, and I feel a fearlessness ah. that, um, <laughs> that really, it, that's in every atom of your being. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, I think the other women in our pod group could, would say the same. And so I wanted to ask you, to what do you attribute that? And um, do you have any advice attached to that? You know, I've had several people point out something similar. And I really think, you know, I lost everything, truly lost everything. I've lost so many things. But I think it's those places that are the hardest in our lives that enrich us the most. Mm -hmm. And I think it's your choice to take from something, either the heartbreak and the horror and the trauma of it, or to take from it the overcoming of it and, mm -hmm. the, and the lesson that you learned from it. Mm -hmm. And it's your choice to choose what you take. And I choose to move forward simply because I've been in that dark place and I don't want to stay there. I don't want to go back. I, you know, I want to keep moving forward. And so I look at all these things that have happened in my life, you know, losing a baby and losing a son to cancer and, and destroying my marriage. And, you know, there's just so many things. Um, I look at them as blessed opportunities for growth. Wow, Toby. And I know you mean that with every fiber of your mm -hmm. being. I've known you for two years now. Yeah. Maybe more. And um, you remind me of a dear friend of mine who, if I would share something that really discouraged me or disappointed me, she would say, okay, I understand that. She said, but what was the gift in it for you? What was the gift in it? And, and when I hear you talk, mm -hmm. I feel like that's what, you're saying the same thing that mm -hmm. you're looking for what 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 good are you extracting or learning from that? Sometimes it's just that I had the strength to put one foot forward. Wow. Sometimes it was only one step, but mm. it was a step forward. I didn't stay stuck there. You I know? know, and you know, I recently had a knee surgery, total knee replacement, and I I uh, they found a tumor in there. And so I had to go to the orthopedic oncologist. And the, of course, when you go to something like that, they want to know your whole life story, every pregnancy you've had, every illness you've had, what your family's medical history is. And so, uh, you know, as I told this uh, physician for sure, my story, she's like, wow, you know, I, you've been through a lot of stuff. And and when the doctor came in and he looked at my knee and I was just a few weeks out of surgery, but I already had it bent in a natural position. And he's like, how did you heal so quickly? And I said, oh, I don't know. I just did what I had to do. And, mm -hmm. and the physician's assistant said she healed so quickly because she has an unbelievable mental strength, mm -hmm. you know, from the, from life, from mm -hmm. the things she's been through. And, and that, you know, it, and all of us can have that. And I just think, you know, sometimes life hurts a little bit and sometimes your heart breaks a little bit, but you move forward anyway, because it doesn't do anyone any good for you to stay stuck there. Yeah. So. It's very profound. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, and another thing I think that really inspires me is that I have found my purpose in life. And I, you know, for so long I looked for my purpose and I didn't know what it was. And, and now I found it and it's so freeing to know what you're supposed to be doing and then do it. it so is. I because, love that. Because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and doing it so well, you're touching the life of 
other people, including myself, including so many people. That That is my goal, you know, and I'll keep doing yeah. it. I don't see myself stopping until physically I can't sit in a chair anymore. Uh, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love that. So, Leslie, I'd like to ask you one final question, and that is, what's one word that inspires you? Authenticity. Mm, that's a good one. You know, I... I would define that as, you know, the ability and the willingness to be yourself with someone or someone's. What does that mean? It, I think it means also the, the willingness to be your natural mm -hmm. self, um, to show and interact with your heart as well as your head to be willing to show what lies beneath the surface, whether it, you know, not always the, the fancy bright stuff, but sometimes the sad stuff. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. they, you know, I, I think even if someone doesn't know us, they know when we're authentic or yeah, not. I think and you, so. they don't have to know you to know yeah. that. Yeah. That, I think you're right. I think you're right. You know, um, but I, I, I think when I think of, an authentic person in my life. I think of you, Toby. And <laughs> I, I do. I think of you and that's why I like you so much. <laughs> well, thank you, Leslie. That's beautiful. I, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. I think that also being authentic to someone else is the most beautiful and genuine invitation for them to be authentic and kind. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, that's why our pod is is so close, I think. I think our, so, too. Mm -hmm. I, I, we've come to that point. I think that's beautiful. I also think in our pod, the fact that we're all working on memoirs requires mm -hmm. us to bear our souls to each other. Yeah, and so I, it really accelerated the friendship that yeah. we formed in our group. So I think that's pretty powerful. I love that word, authenticity. That's a really mm -hmm. important word. Yeah. So thank you so much, Leslie, for your time today. I loved hearing your story, and I know our listeners will, too. Yeah, I'm so shy, and I had so much fun. Uh, it was fun. I, I mean, it's always fun thank to you. talk to you thank in your you. vibrant red today. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Leslie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to Fierce Conversations with Toby. We appreciate all the support you can give. And I'd like to share four ways that really help our show. One, subscribe to our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash fierce conversations, where 10% of our proceeds are used to provide workbooks to women in prison. Two, like and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen and watch by clicking the plus, thumbs up, or the heart button. Pressing subscribe on YouTube as well helps even more. Three, share this episode with your friends and family by telling them about it and posting it on your social media accounts. Four, write a review on whatever platform you are using to listen to this episode. Your support is truly what keeps this show going. The show notes contain links to all the ways you can support us, as well as links to information for our guest today, Leslie Amidi, and links to purchase my books. Fierce Conversations with Toby is created and hosted by Toby Dore and produced by Number 3 Productions, a division of Grace Point Publishing. Music created and arranged by Lisa Plass, owner of From the Top Music Studio. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby. Escape your prison.